Well, thank you very much for, for stopping by tonight. It looks we got a break with the weather. I was I got a little depressed earlier today when I looked at the forecast and it was 90% chance of rain at this hour. So this is not bad at all. Um, and given the date as well, I understood that it was probably going to be difficult to convince some folks to make it out. So we're very excited to see uh, so many faces, especially so many students out here tonight. This is the last of our six speaker events on the 60s and 50, this year-long series that the, the Bucknell Project for American Leadership and Citizenship has been sponsoring to give us a chance to reflect, we hope, in a careful and complex way on not just specifically the history of things that took place uh, during the 1960s, but even more importantly, the, the ramifications, the consequences, and the way that the things that happened in the 60s are still meaningful for us today in American society and American culture in 2019. So typically at this time when I introduce our speaker, I have some other events to cue you in on for the future. Tonight I don't have that to do, and so we'll get right down to the, the business at hand. Our, our speaker tonight is Professor Glenn Lowry, who is at Brown University now as a professor of both economics and you have a social science uh, chair as well, or is it they're, they're the same chair uh, combined? Um, and he's been at Brown now for how many years after leaving? For 14 years. For 14 years. It's been a little while now. And Professor Lowry has written over the last several decades a voluminous amount of, of enlightening scholarship, some of it very specifically technical in the, 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 the economics language that he, was, that he was trained in as a graduate student, some of it in a, in a, in a broader social scientific language, and he's also written a lot in the realm of what we might call the, the, the world of public intellectual discourse on a number of, of topics that we're interested in in this event tonight. The, the theme of tonight's event, I'm, and I have a number of different questions that are going to get at a, 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 a range of, of specific topics on this, is just, I think, in the, in the view of a number of people, thank you. Thank you. The view of a number of, of folks who are interested in the 1960s as a, as a decade of political and social change, this is one of the pieces of that puzzle that looms the largest. And that is, it's, it's undeniably the case that in the 1960s, American society struggled mightily with the question of, of racial inequality and racial conflict in the country not only, but largely having to do with the, the racial conflict and inequality that had been a part of American society from the very origins of American society, and that were at, the, at those origins. In fact, it related to the, the institution of slavery. It's, a, it's an interesting and, and profoundly telling fact that, in, that we were still in the 1960s wrestling with some of these questions and some of these, of these debates and, and problems. And I think arguably we're, we're still wrestling with, with some of these questions today. And so we, we invited Professor Lowry to come tonight to talk to us about this very broad set of questions. And the, the format of the event is, uh, for those of you who've been to other such events, you'll, you'll recognize exactly the same as in the other events. We're gonna, uh, I'm gonna present some questions to Professor Lowry for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Um, let him respond as he sees fit. Maybe I'll respond to responses and we can carry on particular threads of conversation as we, as we find them interesting. And after about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, we'll turn things over to the audience and we, we're very hopeful that we'll, we'll have some, some contributions from the rest of you as to the, the, the tenor and the direction of the conversation. All right, without any further ado then, um, the first of the questions is, is, a, is a fairly straightforward history and interpretation of the 1960s on the racial dynamic question. And it requires a little bit of a setup. So there's a, there's a, a narrative about race relations and racial conflict in the 1960s that's a fairly widespread narrative. It's a, a defensible one even if it's not the only one about the 1960s. Here's how the narrative runs. Up until about the mid-1960s, the, the civil rights movement and the individuals and the groups that made it up were fundamentally predicated upon, they were fundamentally oriented on a view of 
social change in the country, and a specifically a view of social change with respect to race in the country, that was deeply um, connected to what we might call some basic elements of American culture and American history. That is, as an example of this first uh, segment of the, of the civil rights movement, if we talk about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as an exemplar of this approach, if you pay any attention at all to the way in which King talked about the struggle and talked about race relations in the US, he referred constantly to a number of cultural and historical frameworks that he knew a large majority of Americans would agree with or at least would, would understand that language and would be on, on the same base, on the same page with him to a large degree. For example, he often referred to the, the, uh, the American Constitutional Republican Project and referred to the founders and the, and the intentions of the founders and the, and the founding principles of the country as basically sound, even if we, in his language, if we, we, were, we weren't living up to those principles. He often also spoke in the language of uh, a Protestant Christianity that he knew was fundamentally important in the, if, if you, we might say, the founding culture of uh, American society, and that he knew a large number of Americans shared his interest in and his immersion in that religious culture. Uh, so that was the civil rights movement up through the mid-1960s. Beginning in the, in the later 19, mid 1960s rather, and extending through the rest of the decade, a number of other individuals and discourses and groups emerged, which often posed both the question of, of race relations and possible solutions to racial problems in much more radical and sometimes even revolutionary terms. I think one of the exemplary groups here is the, uh, the Black Panther Party. There are a number of other individuals and groups that we might name here. So, so that's, the, that's that narrative that I think a lot of folks, when they think a little bit about race relations in the 60s, they think of it in that way. The, the question, Professor Lowry, is just to, to have you reflect a little bit on what you think, which of those two narratives you think is most influential in how we think at the public level about race relations and racial conflict in the country today. I know you've, you've written a number of times over the years about your own inspiration by the, by the words and deeds of, of Dr. King. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if you might reflect a little bit on what you think about King's spirit today in thinking about race. Is it still alive? Is it still the dominant spirit within which we, we think about race relations? Or has it been replaced by, by other, other ways of framing this set of issues? Well, uh, Professor Riley, the framing of that question is not a neutral move. Uh, creating an opposition, I'm going, to I'm going to answer the question in, in due course, but I, wa I want first to respond to you, the framing of the question. Creating an opposition between a belief in the American system, a uh, magnificent promissory note unfulfilled, vision of the founders about ideas of freedom, Abraham Lincoln's reinterpretation of the founding to include the descendants of slaves or whatever, versus angry black people in the streets, uh, Malcolm X's uh, uh, bellicose language, the Black Panther Party's uh, you know, militancy, black power, black power, and now asking me, as it were, to choose or parse that opposition. Uh, that's not a neutral framing. I, I, I'm not trying to be difficult, but the um, separatist strain, uh, the, the, the radicalism and rejection of the American project as it applies to the Negro predates the 1960s, as I'm sure you know, by, uh, by quite a ways. Uh, Malcolm X is out of the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam, I'm growing up in Chicago in the 1950s and 60s, Nation of Islam is already very well established. Um, we can go back, uh, you know, a few score years to the debates uh, between uh, the uh, followers of um, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois on the one hand and Booker T. Washington on the other, and you can see some of that same kind of kind of uh, tension. So I, I, I just wanted to say that. I wanted to go on the, on the uh, record as saying that. And I'm not a historian, but I can imagine some historians of the period also saying uh, King's effectiveness in his kind of accommodationist pose and his kind of 
credulity and accepting of the American national narrative as the framework within which he was going to elaborate his own aspiration, his effectiveness in that uh, regard was dependent to some degree upon the, the sort of tacit threat that the radicals and the possibility of radicalism pose so that we can't really set these two things on one side versus the other. We have to think about them in some kind of symbiotic way. But let me, let me respond then more in the spirit of the question rather than as a critic of the, of the framing of the question. Um, I would take what the uh, King Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, uh, National Urban League, uh, the NAACP, uh, uh, moderates accomplished in uh, spearheading a movement that actually ended up with uh, very far-reaching uh, legislative enactment that transformed the landscape governing African-American life, uh, opened up opportunities, brought the country around to a different way of looking at its obligations to the descendants of slaves, put a nail in the coffin of Jim Crow. I mean, and this happens within my lifetime. I'm born in 1948. I would hold that up to uh, contrast with what uh, the radicalism, what the shouting of black power, uh, what the uh, rioting in the cities, uh, what the uh, 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 Black uh, uh, Panther Party accomplished, and I don't think it's close. I think that the fruit of King's uh, moderation dwarfs in its uh, continuing impact on the uh, lives of all Americans, including of African Americans, dwarfs uh, the uh, fruit of the, uh, of the radicals. I, I, I'm not poo-pooing radicalism as such, but, I, but I'm saying at the end of the day, in a democracy where you're a small fraction of the population and you're uh, seeking to change the structures, that you ultimately have to persuade your fellows. And how do you persuade them without at least to some degree uh, embracing the um, uh, the, the, the values, uh, the norms, uh, and the national aspiration that uh, animates your fellows. You can't stand outside the system uh, threatening to tear it down at a moment's notice, evidencing contempt for the things that its people hold dear, uh, declaring yourself preemptively as not a part of this enterprise, and expect that you're going to move the needle on how it is that the enterprise conducts its business. So at a pragmatic level, um, I would uh, give the nod to um, the moderation of a Martin Luther King Jr. People say, uh, and they say it today, every time uh, the uh, national holiday comes around that honors uh, King's work, they say, I'm tired of hearing about that 1963, I have a dream speech. I'm tired of hearing about it, that was early King. The king that we ought to be focusing on is the one who in, stood up in the Riverside Church in 1967 and denounced the Vietnam War. The king we ought to be focused on is the one who was leading a poor people's campaign at the end of his life, the one who was at a garbage striker's work in Memphis when he was assassinated. They say, don't give me uh, no uh, warmed over, toned down uh, pablum king. Uh, give me the king that, you know, was rocking the boat and that had uh, seen the problems with capitalism, that had seen the problems with American imperialism and racism, and was prepared to call them out. And I think, I get that. I get why people are saying that. I get why contemporary social justice activists are uh, impatient with uh, the colorblind, I have a dream one day my... You know, children will be judged by the content of their character. Uh, black and white will walk hand in hand together, et cetera, et cetera. I, I understand people's impatience with that rhetoric in our current day, but I just ask people to reflect on what the power of that rhetoric actually was in transforming the structures of American society. And again, I repeat, I don't think um, 
uh, the threats of violence, uh, the, the rejection across the board of American uh, norm, uh, the, the uh, uh, contempt for patriotism, uh, the classification of the founding fathers as a bunch of uh, dead white males who would, half of them were slave owners anyway, and we were three-fifths of a man in the Constitution. I don't think that kind of rhetoric gets us anywhere. Uh, so there's that. You also mentioned the fact that he's a Christian minister. He's a Protestant minister, that the, that the sort of lifeblood of that movement to a certain degree, and certainly its institutional grounding, is flowing through the African-American church, and that he's speaking to a largely Christian and religious nation, uh, asking people to take a good look at what the meaning of their creed might actually be, their civic creed, but also their religious creed. Uh, speaking to them with the authority of that uh, Christian uh, ministry, African American religious uh, heritage out of which he out of which he comes, uh, the anthem of the movement, you know, the the uh, uh, role that uh, the church plays in that, uh, and I I I look with positive uh, uh, attitude on that aspect of that movement. Of course, we are, with the First Amendment and everything else, we're a secular, not a, a, a religious, uh, uh, a civil uh, order. But as a, a matter of culture and, and uh, social uh, uh, structure, uh, religious faith played a very important role in, in that movement. So I, I hope I'm being responsive to you, uh, Professor Riley. Don't ask me to choose. Uh, between uh, the expressed anger and rage of a, of a people who have had a boot on their neck on the one hand and who have uh, given a voice to their, uh, to their frustration and to their fury uh, through being tempted and more than tempted into a radical vein, between that on the one hand and the um, effective public ministry of a Christian leader who begins with the uh, premise that the state is legitimate, uh, that, that uh, on the whole the enterprise is reformable, that those whom he's petitioning can hear his plea, uh, that uh, in fact the nation is worthy of the allegiance of African Americans if it only would live up to its creed. And so don't ask me to choose between those two. Um, I in effect have asserted what I think was the relative historical significance of those two different registers of African-American political expression. Uh, but I, I do think I can understand uh, how it is that both would have come to be. <laughs> I'm thinking about my Uncle Mooney right now. I grew up in Chicago in the 1950s and 60s, as I said. And Uncle Mooney, my mother's sister's husband, was a small-time businessman, a barber, a dry cleaner. Uh, he struggled all of his life. Um, he would bring home to uh, our home, I grew up in that house, uh, the Muhammad Speaks newspaper of the Nation of Islam. He'd bring a copy home every week, leave it on the dining room table, he'd thumb through it. He wasn't a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but he did admire the defiant, uh, independent streak of, I'm not waiting for the white man. And he used to always say, you all talking about King and company, talking about integration, integration? You, I tell you what, you call me when they start integrating the money. That's Uncle Mooney. Call me when they start integrating the money. Okay? So uh, he was an atheist. Uh, he thought that uh, these preachers going around in their mealy mouth uh, spirituals begging white people to relent uh, was undignified, unmanly, he would have said. Uh, I get that. I really do get it. But at the end of the day, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, um, the transformation of the sensibility of much of the American uh, Republic such that uh, the social conventions of a, a Jim Crow South ended up becoming absolutely unacceptable to the uh, mainstream uh, sentiment of the country. You can look at the attitude surveys, I'm sure you have looked at them and you can see all this change in people's willingness to countenance interracial marriage and their belief that blacks were uh, entitled to be able to petition for equal citizenship and so forth. Uh, there's a reason why there's a Martin Luther King Day and there's not a Malcolm X Day. I'm talking about the civic 
culture of the United States. Uh, there's a reason why there's a monument on the mall to uh, uh, honor the work of Martin Luther King. There's a reason why the Nobel Peace Prize Committee uh, decided to anoint him so. Um, and uh, that's not nothing. That, that's, that's, that's quite a bit. So anyway, maybe I've given you enough to, uh, to chew on there. That's, these are my thoughts. And by the way, audience, I am not a historian and I'm not an expert on the 1960s. He, he, he is. I, I, I'm, I'm almost inclined to push a little further on that, but I think just in, in the interest of time, I'd, I'd rather get around to some more specific things that you could, okay. that, that you've actually written substantively about uh, uh, over the years. I mean, your point is well taken that I that uh, both of those, if you will, both those halves of the civil rights movement played off one another to a certain degree, even though they, they were antagonistic too, as, as I'm, I'm sure you know, in, in, in lots of ways, but they. But, but I get that symbiosis. At, a, at another level, though, you are, you're, you're kind of, you're choosing without choosing, if, if at least if the, if the criterion is effectiveness, if it's efficacy. You, you've, or am I, am I misinterpreting you? That no, no, you're not misinterpreting me. And I, I was only going to add that I think uh, the memory of that period, at least as it animates activism on behalf of African Americans today, probably gives less respect than it ought to to King. Hmm and lionizes to a degree that I might regard as excessive. Uh, the Black Panther Party, which was a lot of different kinds of things going on all at the same time. It wasn't right. just free breakfasts for kids and a defiant stance against belligerent police. Uh, it was a lot of things going on. You, you just take a look at who, what happened in the lives of the leaders of the Black Panther Party as we go some decades forward. And it's not entirely a pretty picture at all. Uh, so I, I think there's a romantic kind of, uh, uh, you know, there's this kind of romanticism in a recollection about uh, resistance and, uh, and, and radical uh, uprisings, you know, Watts 1965, uh, Detroit and many others 1968, a kind of, uh, yeah, that was really black power asserting itself, that was black people asserting itself in a kind of contempt or disrespect for the in the spirit of Uncle Mooney, for the uh, more accommodationist and compromising and um, moderation uh, and Christianity and Christian faith of the, of, the, uh, of the movement that King was leading. And I think our present day uh, uh, social justice advocacy on behalf of African Americans might benefit from a rebalancing in which you push down a little bit the weight on the radicalism and pushed up a little bit the weight on. I need to persuade the rest of my fellow Americans who happen not to be black, uh, not by uh, you know, berating them for being racist and threatening to burn down the house, but rather by uh, a, a credible argument on behalf of broad social policies in the interest of uh, you know, working people across the board, kind of thing like that. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about a, a, a two substantive topics that you've written a good deal about over the years. Uh, the first is affirmative action. The second is the, the, the criminal justice system insofar as it operates in a way that, uh, how to put this, that, that contributes to, that produces, for whatever reason, um, racial disparities and outcomes and, and, and a situation in which, uh, according to the arguments of a lot of analysts at least, there are, there are distinctive disparities in terms of how uh, overrepresented African Americans are in the criminal justice system, arguments about how treatment of, of individuals with uh, more or less similar uh, records or more or less, facing more or less similar charges are handled uh, in different ways according that, that, that in some ways correlate with uh, racial identity. So I say you've written about both of these topics um, a good deal over the years. I'm wondering if you could just give us a, a general sense of your view of with respect to affirmative action, your thoughts on the, the track record of affirmative action as a, as a policy or as a set of policies uh, geared toward trying to redress racial inequality. How, how optimistic or pessimistic are you looking forward about the likelihood that, that, uh, that uh, affirmative action policies can, can have a substantial impact on, on alleviating questions and problems of, of racial inequality? And then with respect to the criminal justice system, what, 
I'm thinking here, especially in light of some of the things that have been proposed uh, recently in the, the, the current administration with respect to uh, reform of the criminal justice system. What, what are your thoughts about what direction we should be going in terms of, of, of reform of the criminal justice system to address some of these, some of these problems of racial inequity? Okay, well, I, I see two questions, and they're, they're really quite distinct, so let me take them okay. uh, one at a time. So let's talk about affirmative action. So um, there's, there are different kinds of arguments about affirmative action. Uh, one of them is a legal argument about whether or not uh, the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees the equal protection of the laws to all citizens, is consistent with the practice of using the racial identity of individuals as a factor in uh, treating them in terms of uh, the allocation of resources the, uh, or and opportunities, admissions to colleges, employment, government contracts, and so on. Is it ipso facto uh, unconstitutional to use race in public decision making that uh, benefits uh, blacks and Latinos and women and um, and so on. So that's one kind of question about affirmative action. Another kind of question about affirmative action is, is it leading to outcomes, bracketing for a moment the constitutional issue, assuming for a moment that, uh, it, that uh, it, there, there isn't any uh, sort of trump card, you know, there isn't any killer argument that negates affirmative action a priori. Saying that it's okay to do it, the question is, is it wise to do it? So I wanna, I wanna discuss affirmative action in that manner. Um, I actually am uh, very much influenced by a book by the law uh, legal scholar Randall Kennedy at Harvard. The book is called For Discrimination. For Discrimination. And what Randy argues in that book is, yes, Affirmative action is racial discrimination. Now, it might be uh, strange to think that that's something that has to be argued for, but a lot of people deny that, even deny that racial discrimination is going on. It's not discrimination if we're using a policy in order to try to rectify the effects of past discrimination. But I think Randall was right to observe that, you know, if a university is using the race of applicants as part of how it's uh, making its decisions, if a government agency is using the race of potential vendors as part of how it determines whether or not to let a contract, an employer is using the race of applicants as part of the calculation about whether or not to offer a job, that that employer, in, to the extent that they're making use of race as a factor, is, is engaged in racial discrimination. So Randy says it's racial discrimination. But Professor Kennedy says it's not racial con discrimination that's inconsistent with the 14th Amendment. How perverse would it be to interpret that amendment enacted with the express intent of ensuring the equal citizenship of African Americans? How perverse would it be to interpret it as uh, uh, enjoining a state actor from what would otherwise be thought of as reasonable and moderate uh, 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 use of race and with the purpose of trying to reverse the consequences of, of uh, historic racial discrimination. Uh, that would be perverse, says Kennedy, and I tend to agree with that. So I, I'm not one of those who would respond to affirmative action by saying it's discrimination against non-black or non-Latino people and therefore it's wrong and it must not be done. Uh, it is discrimination <laughs> to the extent that it's undertaken to benefit blacks or Latino, but it's not discrimination that I think should be um, uh, prevented uh, on a constitutional argument. So that's one thing that I would say. But we are uh, here in the year 2019. Um, affirmative action is uh, something that dates back to the late 1960s and really gets going in the 1970s. Uh, President Lyndon Johnson famously says, I believe it's in a commencement address at Howard University in 1965, you don't take someone who's been hobbled by history, the chains that uh, encumber them and bring them up to, you remove the chain, you bring them up to the starting line of a race, and then you set the race off and expect that you're being 
entirely fair, this is a paraphrase of Johnson, what he says is, uh, we need equality as a fact and equality as an outcome, not merely equality in principle or equality as a theory, says Johnson. So we're a half century in to this idea that uh, we got to do something special for the blacks in the, in the competitive venues where they lag behind in order to uh, ensure equality of opportunity. A half century, that's a long time. It's as long from Johnson giving that speech in 1965 to where we sit right here today in 2019, as was the time that expired between Appomattox, where Lee surrenders to Grant, and Versailles, where the First World War is brought to a conclusion. That's a long time. That's three generations. It's a long, long time. So what I've been saying about affirmative action of late is um, I don't want to argue with you about whether or not it's appropriate or just or whatever. I just want to get you to think about the fact that uh, we're now well along the way to institutionalizing as a permanent manner of how we do business, how we admit people to elite colleges, uh, how we decide who's going to be on the faculty of a university, how we decide uh, to think about uh, the uh, allocation of uh, business opportunities when the state goes out and spends billions of dollars building highways or, or purchasing uh, 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 you know, uh, materials or whatever. Um, we're, we're now well along the way to institutionalizing as a permanent practice using a special set of considerations when evaluating uh, African-American aspirants and putting a thumb on the scale on their behalf. Now here's what I want to say about that. It's not equality. It certainly is a distribution of benefits in the direction of African-Americans. That it is. It's a benefit to some African-Americans to be able to enjoy opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise enjoy because of affirmative action. But if the goal is racial equality, baking into the cake the practice of treating blacks specially in virtue of their blackness, people born in the year 2005 is not equality. Uh, I'm a college professor, we're on a college campus. So the question of affirmative action in higher education is a natural one to contemplate. Um, I'm not sure what goes on here, but at Brown we get over 35,000 applications a year and we admit about 1,800 people. That's, that's a pretty selective operation that we're engaged in. We're an elite institution. Average SAT score is, I'm sure it's over 1,400, combined with uh, math and verbal. Uh, it's an elite enterprise. Do we really want to build into our policy going forward forever? The idea that blacks simply can't be judged by the same standard with respect to this kind of uh, undertaking? If indeed it's the case that African-American applicants to a place like Brown University are on the whole not competitive, the numbers would be 3% or 4% instead of 12% or 13% if you did not take race into account when you made the decision about whom to admit. If indeed that's the case, do you think that you're going to get to equality by institutionalizing the practice of lowering the bar Oh, she's black. She's got an 1150, but that's okay. She's black. Do you really think that that's going to get you to equality? It is not. Uh, as a remedial enterprise undertaken in a transitional way with the intent of directly addressing historical inequity and trying to get on a different track than what had been, say the year is 1975, Okay, I can see that. As a permanent practice? As the way of doing business? As a, in effect, compensatory uh, endowment to people of color? 
so that they can be represented in numbers that uh, don't actually reveal the disparity in their performances? It's a lot of things, but it's not equality. It leads to a lot of things that are not healthy, like patronization. Oh, uh, we don't really expect the soft bigotry, low expectations. We don't really expect our African-American students are presumptively disadvantaged. Think about that. You're black and you're presumptively disadvantaged? In virtue of being black? We need diversity, we need representation. Oh, I see, now the African-Americans uh, who are included in this uh, rat race competition to get into these places. Everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. You apply to 20 colleges because you don't know whether you're gonna get into one of them or not. We create a world in which um, the presence of African-Americans is justified because they uh, leaven uh, the mix, because they bring some color to the table? It's a lot of things, but it's not equality. Uh, so, what I've been saying of late uh, about this question is, okay, you wanna do affirmative action, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, I'm not gonna fall on my sword about it. Me personally, I'm not gonna throw a fit. Uh, no, no, it's not the same thing as racial discrimination against blacks in the history and so forth and so on. You, you go ahead and do it if you wanna do it. But, if you really want equality, you wouldn't be satisfied with that. If you really want equality, you would address yourself to the foundational root of why it is that African Americans as a population are underrepresented at the right tail of the distribution of, uh, of intellectual and academic performance. Unless you do that, unless you change that foundational root, you'll never get equality. So you decide. You want representation? or you want equality? You want titular representation? You want a cover story? Or you want equality? Do you, are you interested in developing the human potential of the African American population? Or are you merely interested in covering your ass by being able to present an optics that shows that you're a diverse and inclusive institution? So no, I'm not against affirmative action, but I'm against hypocrisy, I'm against condescension, okay? Um, and I'm uh, uh, asking people to uh, imagine what kind of country we're gonna be in. Uh, really? We're gonna do this for another 30 years? We're gonna do this for another 50 years? This is where we're gonna be? It's, an, in my mind, unacceptable vision for our country that we're gonna depend upon treating black people differently because everybody knows they can't Cut it. Unacceptable. Um, so, I mean, this uh, uh, controversy about the exam schools in New York City, you know, yeah. Brooklyn Tech, Bronx uh, Science, uh, Stuyvesant. So they have an exam, they give the exam. Uh, tens upon tens of thousands of people take it. They're admitting hundreds. Uh, Stuyvesant constitutes a class, an uh, incoming class for the fall of next year. I think it's 895 admits. Seven of them are black. And the newspaper article says, in the spirit of affirmative action, um, uh, racial segregation returns to uh, uh, New York City's high schools, right? The presumption is the low number of African Americans being admitted is a reflection of the failure of the institution to be fair and open to all people. It is not. It's a reflection of something else, something less pretty, something much more challenging, something much more profoundly going to the heart of what's wrong in our country. It's a reflection of the failure to develop the human potential of those youngsters who happen to be black. The, the, the test is only a messenger. It's merely telling us what people know and what they don't know. Let's get rid of the test. Let's put a quota on the schools. Let's raise those numbers. Not, not, not. 
Let's develop those people so that they can compete. I saw some statistics the other day about Brooklyn Tech uh, where over 60% of the students are Asian. That more than half of them are also disadvantaged in the sense that they qualify for uh, public benefit. They are not rich middle class kids on the whole who are floating in the Brooklyn Tech because their parents bought a test prep course for them. There are youngsters, many of whom are disadvantaged, who are developing their capacity to function in the high tech world that we live in in the 21st century. The low numbers of African Americans who are exhibiting that degree of excellence is a warning sign, not about whether or not Brooklyn Tech or New York public schools are racist, but whether or not our society is developing the human potential of all of its people. Now we could go into the reasons why, and they will be many, and the fault will not fall only on white people. We can talk about why our youngsters are not performing better. Yes, they deserve to have better schools, and maybe they deserve to have different parenting. And maybe the culture is, to some degree, to be faulted. And I know I'm not supposed to say that. But what I can see is huge differences across racial groups in their ability to function within American society. And what I can tell you is nobody is coming to save our black youngsters from the loss of developing their human potential. Nobody is coming. So um, my views about affirmative action have uh, evolved, obviously, over time. Um, I used to be one of those people who said, oh, no, it was just racial discrimination. It was just reverse discrimination, and we shouldn't do it. And then I became one of those people who said, oh, oh no, wait a minute. I, I do think we need to defend affirmative action and whatnot. And now I'm one of these people who's saying, OK, whatever. Are we ever going to get serious about the actual problem of inequality and address ourselves to it? Affirmative action doesn't take us to, uh, to that point. Imagine how weak and, at the end of the day, pathetic it is to be in this position of begging not to have affirmative action taken away. Throwing a tantrum not to have them take away affirmative action. We want our affirmative action. Pathetic. Well, it's becoming a small place. There are billions of people on the planet. The internet is bringing everybody online and it's bringing everybody into the mix. We need to develop our people's potential. Now, I don't think that we can do that alone, but I don't think affirmative action is very helpful in addressing that problem. So that's where I am on that. Can we, can we talk just a little bit more about what you think, a two-pronged question, in fact. You touched a little bit on the first piece of it. What are some of the other things that American society specifically ought to be doing to enhance the, the, the human capital of, 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 of these kids? And the second thing is what, I know you've, you've written a good deal and you've talked a good deal over the years on the podcast and elsewhere about what as, how as social scientists we, we have some sense of what the actual causal factors are that are involved in leading to particular kinds of disparate outcomes. And I, that's a tremendously complicated discussion, so I don't, we can't get too far into the weeds. Well, let me, let me sort of short circuit this a little bit because anything that we might be doing um, so we could talk about the schools, we could talk about education. Uh, we could talk about poverty and we could talk about opportunity. We could talk about the way cities are organized and uh, concentrated poverty in the cities and whatnot. Anything that we would be thinking about doing, if it's charter schools, if it's more money, it's uh, you know, uh, investing in early childhood education, if it's uh, 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 higher quality childcare, whatever we might be talking about, we can't talk about that in a nation of 330 million people here in the United States of America strictly in terms of racial equity. These are matters that have to do with the development of all of our people, including African Americans. So I, I don't regard the uh, policy discussion about uh, what do we do to, uh, at least the public government policy discussion about what do we do to raise uh, to narrow the gap, to address the achievement gap, is uh, something that should be discussed uh, primarily in racial terms. Um, I, I uh, think, though, that uh, part of the conversation has got to be a conversation, if I'm talking about African American underachievement, that happens amongst African Americans about our own institutions and our own uh, communal values and our own social practices. 
um, you know, it's hard not to notice that uh, uh, the uh, structure of African American family has undergone dramatic changes in the last half century. Um, that uh, the uh, effect on the child development of uh, the uh, parenting practices and so forth is something that needs to be uh, taken, taken seriously, that uh, peer influences and uh, whatnot are, uh, are a factor. But the longer I talk, the more trouble I'm going to get into because I'm not actually presenting any solutions and it's going to look like I'm, I'm, I'm you know, waving a finger of indictment at people, which I may be doing to some degree. Um, but uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I lost track of do you want to, Do you want to move on to maybe to, the, to criminal justice and, the, and some of your thoughts on what, uh, what we ought to be doing to, to think about that as a society? Uh, criminal justice and uh, criminal justice reform, mass incarceration, um, mm -hmm. Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow, uh, Glenn Lowry, race incarceration and American values. Mm -hmm. Um, the racist character of the American criminal justice system, uh, William Jefferson Clinton signing into law the 1994 Omnibus Crime Bill, uh, etc. Uh, war on black people. Uh, so uh, I gave these lectures at Stanford, gosh, it's been over a decade now, that uh, uh, were published as a small book called Race, Incarceration, and American Values. And I was very angry when I delivered the lectures, very outraged at the fact that we had, uh, as a nation, chosen as the primary instrument of our response to uh, the problems of underdevelopment of uh, African American potential and of social disorder in uh, our uh, urban environments, we had decided that the primary instrument that we would use to address ourselves to the, to the uh, social uh, disorder and the problems that emerged was going to be punitive. We were going to lock them up and throw away the key. We elaborated a politics in which uh, people would run for office basically on uh, that kind of finger pointing and the promise that they were going to be tough on crime. Uh, we had. Uh, constructed these institutions of prisons that had grown from uh, 400 or 450,000 people under lock and key on a given day in 1980 to 2 million people under lock and key uh, by the time we get to the year 2000. A massive footprint, the so-called prison industrial complex, the uh, institutional uh, uh, mechanism for controlling people, for physically confining them. Uh, I thought it an outrage that our um, sort of moral sensibility didn't look beyond the immediate problem. We have an offense, we need to punish the offender, we need to protect the uh, people who have not yet been victimized and stand up for those who have been victimized. We need to choose between the innocent prey on the one hand and uh, what we're going to do with these thugs on the other, that kind of sensibility, I, I thought it and think it outrageous, wrong. Looking around the world, American society, a vast outlier compared to other uh, comparable democratic uh, industrial societies and the extent to which we relied on incarceration. Uh, the war on drugs, balancing our cultural budget on the backs of the weakest of our fellow citizens. Uh, what an outrage. We don't want our kids to use drugs. There's a market. It's a hundred billion dollar a year market in uh, heroin and methamphetamines and cocaine and marijuana and so on. Uh, it's a huge, huge underground economy. Who do you think is going to be a foot soldier in such an enterprise? Somebody with a bright, shiny future because they've got a college degree or they've got middle class parents? Mm. Or somebody who grew up in a housing project running with gang members and so forth who flunked out of high school and uh, hasn't got any hope, any prospects? The latter, the latter are going to be, be the people who are you going to find on the street corners, uh, you know, darting over to the car as the suburban buyer drives by with the window down, hundred dollar bill going out the window, a couple of small packets of cocaine coming in. Who do you think is going to be the one who's risking his life with three thousand dollars in his back pocket and a pistol tucked into his belt because he doesn't want to get robbed? Who do you think is going to do that? 
of course it's going to be people who don't have any other prospects. Of course the uh, black and Latino youngsters are going to be overrepresented amongst those. And so you don't want your kid to use drugs. <coughs> you think drugs is a scourge on the society. And you elaborate a law enforcement and punishment regime that basically puts the weight of that on the weakest and the most marginal of our fellow citizens when it was a social problem mm -hmm. to begin with. But that's horrible in, in my mind. Of course, the war on drugs is not the only thing going on about incarceration. In fact, uh, certainly today, I don't know about 1980, but we, we could look, and I doubt that it was true then either, uh, the uh, majority, of, I almost want to say the vast majority of people who are incarcerated are not incarcerated for nonviolent drug offenses. They're incarcerated for violent offenses and for property offenses. But even so, so, Mass incarceration, mass incarceration is racist. America is a racist country because of mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is the new Jim Crow. That narrative had and has a lot of appeal to me. On the other hand, I think about what it would mean to be insecure in my property and person as an ongoing condition of my life, living in some place that I can't afford to move away from where crime rates are high and where people are being preyed upon. Hmm. I think about when people talk about criminal justice reform, they, people talk about abolition of prisons. Okay, and they're serious about it. Uh, and they're using race and racial inequality as part of the advocacy, uh, the justification for their advocacy of that. <coughs> I think about uh, the people who have to live with, uh, with the consequences of, uh, of a violent criminal uh, acts uh, taking place in their midst. I think about the grandmother who has to bury the six-year-old child that's shot in the head by a stray bullet from a drive-by shooting between two belligerents, etc. I think about the person trying to get gas at a pump at two o'clock in the morning and someone comes along to jack their car and when they don't hand the keys over right away, ends up with a slug in the chest, and so on. Um, and I think Maybe our sentences are too long. Okay. Maybe what we do when we confine people has no aspect of human development to it and is only about punitive and confinement and we could do a lot better. Maybe we could learn something from the Germans or the Swedes or whatever it might be about what you do with people whom you are removing from society, at least temporarily. Hmm. <coughs> that gives them some prospect of having a different life when they return. Maybe we needn't have this uh, kind of collateral sanction uh, regime where we disqualify a person from eligibility for Pell Grants or public housing or whatever it might be because they've offended, they've made a mistake, they've paid their dues and they want now to come back into society but we nevertheless hang this thing on their necks uh, because we're still mad at them uh, for having, uh, having violated our social compacts. There's a lot of room for reform it seems to me. They're, they're, I do think our sentences are too long. I think capital punishment is an abomination. I don't know why it is that the state needs to take human life in ritualized ceremonies of revenge, extirpating human life. Uh, there, there's no necessity in that, although that doesn't necessarily, uh, there is a racial disparity, of course, in the incidence of capital punishment. But the number of people being executed is a relatively small number, but still the symbolic aspect of it I think about uh, a politics, it, it should not be acceptable practice in American politics to do what George uh, Herbert Walker Bush did to Michael Dukakis in that 1960, 1988 election where Dukakis uh, endorsed a uh, furlough program for prisoners in Massachusetts. And one of those prisoners who happened to be black uh, ended up committing a horrible crime on, while out on furlough. And, Willie Horton. Uh, right. Yeah, that was yeah. Willie Horton and uh, Lee Atwater and, and uh, George Bush the first hung that around the candidate Dukakis's neck with a commercial that kind of showed a black man going through a revolving door of a prison. Mm -hmm. And you know, you could imagine what, what uh, that would trigger in the minds of a person who's listening to it about what that person might do. Mm -hmm. So, so what am I saying? This is somewhat, uh, uh, you know, rambling kind of response here. I'm, I'm saying, on the one hand, I, I am on the record 
as objecting to the elaboration of this massive uh, punitive uh, structure, set of structures uh, that we've elaborated. And I think it does need to be pared back. And frankly, I think that if the bulk of the people suffering from it uh, had been a little bit more sympathetic to the median voter in a lot of jurisdictions, that is to say if they'd been white, you would have seen some uh, questions being raised. Stop and frisk, three strikes and you're out? Three strikes and you're out? Three felonies and you're going to jail for 25 years to life? Um, you would have seen a, a different kind of management of this problem. I think that. I think our sentences are too long. I think that we don't do enough to try to put people in a position where they can be constructive members of society, given that we do have their attention while we're confining them, and so on. Hmm. On the other hand, I do think that, um, especially when I think about the fact that the people who have mostly to deal with the depredations of uh, criminal offending are themselves uh, members of racial minority groups and low-income people. They can't move away. They can't hire a security guard. They can't build a wall around themselves to protect themselves from the threats that lurk outside. Uh, I think a more nuanced uh, view about this, I mean, as I say, I, I'm, I'm not one who's going to sign on to the abolitionist movement with respect to prisons. I'm not one who thinks that the fact that there are institutions of law enforcement and punishment is in and of itself an act of racial domination. Uh, I do want to hold people responsible for the acts that they undertake. I, I want to give them the benefit of presuming them capable of making choices other than the ones that they've made. I don't want to say about them, oh, they're poor, they're black, they grew up in a ghetto, and therefore, what could we expect? Uh, that, that seems to me to be terribly patronizing. <coughs> so uh, I offer that. Very good. Shall we, shall we perhaps turn it over to the audience to see if there are any <coughs> questions that folks would like to pose? Uh, do we have a mic by any chance floating around that we can maybe assign an eager student to, to carry around? There we go. Check and do. Check. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. So we got lots of questions. Yes. Uh, so thank you for coming today. Um, and I just wanted to say, uh, so I was really interested in your response to the question from Professor Rowley about affirmative action. Um, I know there's quite a bit of overlap between the argumentation for affirmative action and reparations for the black community. And um, I can kind of, you know, probably form a guess to your response based on some of your answers to the question. Uh, I was just interested in wondering if you think reparations are owed to the black community and um, kind of the impact of how that would change the status of the position of the black community. And if you even think, um, I mean, regardless, I know there's quite a bit of economics behind it, and there's a logistical question as well, but regardless of logistics and economics, um, do you think it would even help the black community in America, and it, is it, should it be paid? Um, I think the question is, do I think reparations? About reparations, yeah, just, just in case folks uh, didn't hear, it's, uh, yeah, it's a question about reparations. Well, it's certainly a relevant question because reparations uh, talk is back in American politics again, hmm. given the campaign season. Um, I remember uh, the book by Randall Robinson that I think was published, I can't remember, 99, 2000, the book was called uh, The Debt. Uh, and it was a passionate argument uh, for the case that African Americans would do reparations. And of course, I uh, recall ta Coates's influential uh, long uh, essay in The Atlantic only a few years ago, uh, The Case for Reparations. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. Are African Americans owed reparations? Okay, so there are a number of sort of lower level kind of technical issues like who's an African American for the purposes of that question given that uh, the population is composed of people who've come from various places at different times and so forth. Um, <clears throat> 
there's philosophical questions about whether or not the intergenerational obligation uh, is of such a nature, that is the obligation incurred by the fact of chattel slavery or the denial of equal citizenship to the de immediate descendants of the slaves creates an entitlement or a benefit that uh, is uh, appropriately um, uh, you know, endowed uh, on or to uh, contemporary people uh, who happen to uh, be African American. Um, I actually think that little, I'll go on, but I want to just say uh, that that little bit of the question is kind of interesting and maybe even ironic to me because if I said that uh, a family has a right to pass its wealth on from one generation to the next without the encumbrance of inheritance tax, a lot of progressives would say, you know, or call it the death tax as the Republicans like to call it, a lot of progressives would say, oh no, no, just because your father made a lot of money doesn't mean you're entitled to anything, they'd say. You didn't earn it. Well, likewise, uh, just because my ancestors may have been deprived of the fruits of their labor by being forcibly enslaved doesn't mean that I, necessarily, that I am entitled to anything. Oh, I would have been better off, the wealth would have been passed on. I mean, I really don't see conceptually a distinction between the one and the other. In some sense, intergenerational entitlement being transferred from uh, one generation to the next is intergenerational entitlement being transferred from one generation to the next. But that's not my main point. Uh, do the facts of slavery and Jim Crow segregation and inequality and restrictive covenants and racial discrimination and poll taxes and literacy tests uh, and uh, anti-miscegenation laws and all of that figure in a social scientifically identifiable way in accounting for some of the disadvantage of African Americans? I have no doubt that that's true. I have no doubt that history casts a long shadow. That some dimension of African American poverty does indeed derive from historical uh, mistreatment of, of African Americans. Saying how much it would, it seems to me, be a bridge too far. I don't know how you do that as an empirical project, but the qualitative claim that history casts a long shadow and is implicated in the conditions of African Americans, it seems to me, is certainly true. But I don't go from that observation, as ta Coates does in his essay, as Randall Robinson does in his book, I don't go from the observation that history casts a long shadow and that the, uh, the, the, the dispossession of my ancestors has to some degree affected my opportunity to the conclusion that a contemporary program of the government uh, getting in the business of uh, distributing reparations to African Americans is a good idea. In fact, I think exactly the opposite. I think the fact that history casts a long shadow has an implication which is that the determination to redress the consequences of that history is open-ended. It is not quantifiable and it's not commodifiable. I know that's not a word, I just made up a word. You can't convert it into a commodity and trade it on a table as a quid pro quo. What I fear about reparations advocacy is its success. There are 30, odd million African Americans, maybe it's close to 40 by now. What's the number going to be? 10,000 ahead? Let's see, 10,000 times uh, 40 million is 400 billion dollars. Oh, maybe it's 100,000 ahead, that'll be 4 trillion dollars. Um, and then what have we got? <clears throat> uh, we got some people with money in the bank, certainly they're better off. And we also have a nation who can do like this with respect to its obligation to reckon with the consequences of whatever its historical mistreatment of black people has wrought. Commodifying the claims that African Americans have on the nation, on the nation, commodifying it discharges the obligation. Do I really think that uh, the Congress of the United States or anybody else is gonna uh, enact payments adequate in their magnitude 
to indemnify the recipients from the possibility that uh, they might yet find themselves uh, again in a position of, of uh, disadvantage. I don't think so. Do I think it's going to make reading scores go up? I don't think so. Do I think it's going to make incarceration rates go down? Maybe only moderately. Uh, do I think it's going to lead to a rectification of all of the problems that we have and all of the gaps that we have and the disparities and the disadvantage? Actually, I don't think so. So, so my, my problem with reparations is that it converts what ought to be a relational uh, uh, discourse. How do we relate to our fellow citizens and what are our obligations as Americans into a transactional discourse? I'm getting paid, you owe me. It pits what ought to be all of us together confronting the problems of disadvantaged people in this society into competing groups on either side of a bargaining table. I can't believe that the Democratic Party is going to go into this election against Donald Trump with reparations as one of the arrows in their quiver. I get why a Democratic primary candidate who wants to uh, win the South Carolina primary would do that, because he's pandering to black voters. But I can't imagine that a serious uh, effort to try to unseat the incumbent president would, in, would encumber itself uh, with such a divisive uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, ethnically partisan uh, uh, policy. So again, I don't know, I'm, I, I'm getting a little tired up here, guys, so forgive me if I, if I wander a bit. Um, I, I'm against the reparations rallying cry, I, I really am. I have practical reasons who's a black person and who's entitled. Uh, I have political reasons. Uh, man, you, got, you think you're going to win an election with that? I don't think so. Oh, 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 I see. People who are opposed to reparations are racist. That card works really well in the Ivy League campus setting where I live. But I happen to think out here in western Pennsylvania, is that where I am? Central Pennsylvania, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's not going to fly, and I think that's where the election is going to be decided in the year 2000. Um, so, <clears throat> um, how about this? How about those of us who are concerned about the lasting effects of slavery and Jim Crow as they manifest themselves in the lives of very poor and disadvantaged and marginalized people? How about if we get about the business of building a coalition of poor, disadvantaged, and marginalized people of all races and try to uh, uh, formulate a politics in which the essential needs of those people for opportunity would be at the center of our advocacy? I'm prepared to include white people, brown people, yellow people, red people, as well as black people in that effort. That would be, I think, a serious American political enterprise. This sectarian enterprise, y'all disadvantaged my ancestors and I need to get paid. Um, I don't think it's going anywhere and I don't think, frankly, it should go anywhere. Other questions? Thanks for your answer for that question. And again, thanks for coming and speaking to us. Um, I'd like to address the affirmative action question uh, again. Um, I guess my question would lead to, I guess, when affirmative action was, I guess, put in place, at what point do you think that it stopped being effective? And at what point do you think it should have ended? Okay, that's a fair question, and it's a difficult one as well. Uh, the position that I tried to elaborate was we are a long way down the line, but that means, and, and I did suggest that there was a time when I could see uh, that uh, that would be a way in which uh, we could uh, try to respond to the, uh, to the hand that we've been dealt by history of there being very few blacks uh, included. So at what point? 
So what did Sandra Day O'Connor say in uh, that uh, 2002, I believe it was, case, uh, the Supreme Court case, uh, Grutter uh, versus uh, somebody, Bollinger, somebody, University of Michigan. She said, uh, I'm gonna go along with this uh, program, this is about higher education, I'm gonna go along with affirmative action, uh, but it's something that I hope we wouldn't have to be doing in 25 years. That's what she said. 15, 17 years ago. So I prefer to respond to you in that spirit and to say something like, um, because if we go cold turkey, uh, there, there would, the, the effects of doing so would be very, very dramatic. But I, but you know, Sorry, I, this is not as crisp as I would want it to be. Uh, I'm sitting here thinking about my children, I'm thinking about my grandchildren. I really don't want to uh, imagine uh, a world in which my grandchildren, in virtue of being black, were uh, the subjects of some kind of uh, special or differential treatment. My grandchildren, it doesn't seem like that's warranted. Uh, sorry, I know I'm not answering your question. <laughs> uh, I can't put my finger on a year. Uh, I'm going to use the year 2000 just as a, because you've asked me a question, I should give you an answer. Uh, that would have been a good quarter century plus. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that, that's the best I can do, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so first of all, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I really enjoyed hearing your view of affirmative action. And my question is, what is your solution to developing the human functionings and entitlements of young Americans, black or white or whatever race, who are disadvantaged in the United States? Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Amartya Sen, who is a Nobel laureate prize winner in developmental yes, economics. Yes, I am familiar with him. Um, but he offers an entitlement and functioning framework that increases the entitlements of disadvantaged people to boost human development through an institutional approach. Uh, do you think that applies to this situation as well? Can you repeat I the didn't question? Hear, yeah, I didn't the hear the details. Can you slow down just a little bit with the end after Amartya Sen? Uh, yeah, so basically just with Amartya Sen's framework, do you think that an institutional approach will apply to the uh, situation of um, increasing the human functionings and entitlements of disadvantaged people. So an institutional approach to, yeah. I'm still uh, not hearing well. What, to increasing the functionings of disadvantaged young Americans. To increasing the functions of disadvantaged young Americans. I'm not sure what the, is there a specific aspect of what Sen is arguing? Is this development as freedom? Is this yeah, the, yeah, development the as freedom. you're referring to? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, let me try this. Um, it seems to me there are two narratives that one can embrace, broadly speaking, in thinking about race and inequality in America, what I'm gonna call the bias narrative and what I'm gonna call the development narrative. So the bias narrative is, a, you know, discrimination is wrong, racial discrimination is wrong, uh, it is an ongoing feature of American society and we need to fight against it with civil rights laws, with hate crime legislation, with affirmative action or reparations to rectify the consequences of bias. The development narrative is one that says history casts a long shadow to be sure, but the work at hand for us today is ensuring that each American, including each African American, has full opportunity to realize their human potential. So as I understand Sin's argument in that book, Development as Freedom, he's saying uh, economists have heretofore uh, studied development as a question of um, GDP growth, uh, industrialization, <coughs> um, uh, per capita incomes, and so on. <coughs> In a, in a very crassly materialistic way, 
in a monetary way. But what we really want to think about when we talk about development is uh, the ability of people to live lives that they have, that they value and that they have reason to value. And that's going to get us talking about things like uh, sanitation, education, uh, about uh, the rights of women, about democracy and, and people's capacity to be heard in, as they participate in public deliberation, um, uh, about uh, being free from the fear of uh, starvation and famine, uh, and things of this sort. Don't cast a narrow conception of development, as I understand sin. Understand development as happening when people's ability to uh, achieve the uh, uh, aspirations that uh, uh, are most important to them, where they're, they're free in that sense. So I'm trying to draw an analogy between this, uh, this uh, masterful uh, reflection on uh, the uh, problem of development and underdevelopment in a global context on the one hand, and uh, the challenges that, uh, that confront us here in the United States with respect to inequality and racial inequality on the other. And I'm saying in that analogy that whereas sin is trying to generalize from a crude economistic way of bean counting of uh, <clears throat> uh, gross national product, which might not attend to uh, whether or not they're indoor toilets or whether or not there's a school for an eight-year-old or whether or not women are free to uh, not have to bear children at the age of 14. Uh, Sin is making that critique of a certain way of looking at development in a global context, and I want to make a critique of a certain way of looking at racial inequality in the domestic context. Uh, I want to uh, juxtapose uh, uh, being free of anti-black bias with achieving the full human potential of black people. Of course, those things are not unrelated, and I'm sure Sin would acknowledge that GDP is not unrelated to his goal of development as freedom. Resources, after all, are a necessary condition for much of what he would want to see done. And I think the elimination of bias is a necessary, or the attenuation of it in any case, is a necessary condition for what I want to see done. But I want to put the emphasis on reading scores, on two-parent families, on keeping your nose clean and not getting in trouble with the law, and having laws that respect your humanity, and having a police force that, uh, that relates to you as they should. They're your servants, not your masters. Um, I want to put the emphasis on development. When I see the disparity, I want to close it. But I want to close it not so much by pointing a finger at a racist and having that person removed from the scene. I want to close it by recognizing that the disparity is more likely than not a reflection of the fact that people are not performing as uh, effectively as they could, and that obligation falls to us to try to do something about it. And then I want to recognize in a multiracial democracy like the one that I live in, that there's no way to do anything about the development of African Americans on a large scale with the support of the state without doing those same things for other Americans who happen not to belong to this uh, ethnicity uh, but who also may be in need of uh, encouragement, support, and opportunity. You said you were getting tired 15 minutes ago. How do you oh, I'm not trying to get, uh, yeah. you know, you guys are paying me. I'm, I'm willing to work for my, you know, my compensation. <laughs> but I am tired. I mean, uh, I just want you to know, so if my, if my sentences don't flow quickly, if I'm unable to answer this young woman's question about when did I think affirmative action was, you know, whatever, it's probably only because I'm not firing on all cylinders at this moment. Being on a plane all day, all morning long, we'll, 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 we'll do that, have that effect on It you. took like six hours to it's, get here. It's ridiculous, <laughs> yeah. Do we have maybe one more question if we have another one? Uh, hello. We do have one. Yes, no, I'm, I'm a, a radio and television engineer of 47 years. And, you know, when I started, the FCC had rules of what the stations had to do. Now, of course, I was working on the equipment, but also was on the air. But we didn't have anything like, okay, there was no political correctness back then. And I think that that, when, when they started that, that kind of, I mean, I'm just saying on, 
on black people, but everyone just saying, okay, you know, this is, this is the way it is. But that's, that, that's not fair to a, a group who's trying to get along in this country. Uh, no, no, that it's, wasn't okay, a question okay, so much as a okay, statement. Okay, right? Yeah, as, as far as the meat. So it's like, like is, is there any spokesman or from the meat? Or, like, I, I wouldn't say the press and that, but is there, any, is there anyone uh, within your organization that is, is, is handling, I'm going to say the, I wouldn't say the conflict, but uh, like approaching it and, and maybe maybe open up to uh, forums of a discussion like here, because that's, that's what uh, you know, intrigued me to come here. Okay, I hear political correctness, but I, I'm not hearing very much. Um, yeah. No. You, 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 yeah. You're talking about within an organization. Is there anyone within an organization? Yeah, no, as far, okay, as, you know, as far as the media coming up or anything with political correctness on, you know, on, on the air of people you know, have, are taking stands on different issues. And uh, you know, is, is, is that a problem? Uh, does, has that created a problem? Uh, I'm going to say for your organization since since that started. I'm, I'm I'm talking about press coverage and people coming and calling in on the air and all these talk shows and everything. Uh, Not getting which organization yeah. you mean you, you, in the university context broadly. You mean is are there yeah, problems yeah. with political in the larger That's context? Right. Yeah. That, yeah. Okay, I'm going to answer, uh, I'm going to speak, and I may not be answering. You can, you can further instruct me. Uh, is there a problem with the way that we talk about these issues to the extent that some things which may be true and which need saying are not being said or not being said often enough and loudly enough because of a fear of giving offense or soliciting a kind of pushback uh, you know, uh, in the spirit of political correctness? Uh, is it that the press, uh, the mainstream media, the liberal media uh, are uh, biased in the way in which they cover uh, these issues, uh, frame these issues, so as to uh, preclude the kind of thinking and uh, 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 policy initiatives such as what I might advocate because of political correctness? That, is that, a, is that anywhere yes. near your question? Yes. Okay, so. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I often uh, feel that people know better than what they say. Right, right. But, but they say it anyway. For example, I don't think anybody really believes that uh, Brown University is a racist institution. I give Brown because I don't know Bucknell. Y'all may be a racist institution. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of liberal uh, academics up there who want to do the right thing as best they can and want to be diverse and open and inclusive and whatever, whatever. And yeah, some of them are uh, into the study of dead white males and some of them are, uh, you know, have their doubts about affirmative action. But I'll bet you if I have uh, 500 colleagues, three of them voted for Donald Trump, max. Brown's not a racist institution. I don't think anybody believes it. And yet, and yet, uh, let uh, a controversy arise. Uh, let a speaker come to campus who says something that uh, some people don't, don't like. Let a student publish an article in the newspaper defending Columbus Day. This actually happened. Kids said, yeah, 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 I know, but you know, uh, Columbus discovery of the quote unquote new world, that was kind of a pretty momentous thing at the end of the 15th century and it actually had a lot of consequences that are not all bad in terms of uh, global uh, uh, social economic development subsequently. And oh you know, you would think that um, uh, somebody had printed in uh, two inch high letters the N word right across the top of the, of the newspaper. Uh, so in an environment like that, people become cautious and they're very careful about what they say. Um, I think everybody concerned about uh, urban crime, violence, and policing knows that the cops are not the main problem in terms of the integrity of black lives. They know that the high rate of homicide within the African American community is the main problem in terms of the objective threat to black lives. Now that doesn't mean 
that there's not an issue to talk about with respect to the cops. It just means that there's more than one issue to talk about if I'm concerned about black lives. Everybody knows this. And yet, if, uh, who is it, Mayor Pete or somebody uh, said at one point in time, we should say all lives matter, not black lives matter, and then a ton of bricks falls on him, and then he comes out and he apologizes, and he, you know, uh, mumbles about how he didn't understand at that time how important it was to carve out the special, except, you know, whatever. That, that's all smoke and mirrors. It's not, that's, that, you know, it, 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 it has very little relationship to the objective problem uh, uh, at hand. Uh, I think everybody knows that Bill Clinton is not a racist and neither is Hillary Clinton. I think everybody knows that. You had to be there in 1994 Hindsight is 2020. You had to be there in 1994. Uh, how many uh, presidential elections had the Republicans won uh, since George McGovern? They lost in 76. They won in 80. They won in 84. They won in 88. Bill Clinton comes along and he says, uh, oh, I'm sorry, they won in 68 and they won in 72. Bill Clinton comes along and he says, I think the Democratic Party needs to have a program that actually addresses itself to the sensibilities of the median voter in a lot of districts. <coughs> and I think we overshot, and so the new Democrats go out and they do what they did. That was 1988 to 1992. So here we sit in the year 2016, I'm thinking about that campaign with Hillary Clinton, and people are saying, uh, Michelle Alexander said this. She said this in the pages of The Nation. I wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton. She's a racist because she used the term super predator. Okay. Uh, do I need to finish that sentence? Donald Trump is president. Yeah. Hillary Clinton's a racist? Donald Trump is president. Uh, so uh, my answer to you is yes, I, I think that the, the character of the discourse is encumbered uh, not only by punishing people who, you know, step out of line according to whatever the politically correct nostrums of the day are, but by dishonesty. Anyway. Thank you, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, please. Okay. You guys just stuck around? I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> it's a Friday. They're sleepy as well. So, Thanks very much, and especially to those folks who have made it out for a number of the events over the course of the year. Very much appreciated. And uh, thanks uh, a million times to Professor Lowry for making it out today.